As the night began to fall, the 5th Virginia, retiring steadily toward the pike, filed into a narrow lane, fenced by a stone wall, nearly a mile distant from their last position, and there took post for a final stand. Their left was commanded by the ridge, and on the heights in the rear, coming up from the Opequon Valley, appeared a large mass of northern cavalry. It was a situation sufficiently uncomfortable. If the ground was too difficult for the horsemen to charge over in the gathering darkness, a volley from their carbines could scarcely have failed to clear the wall. A single ramrod, it was said in the Confederate ranks, would have spitted the whole battalion. But not a shot was fired. The pursuit of the Federal infantry had been stayed in the pathless woods, the cavalry was held in check by Funston's squadrons, and the 5th was permitted to retire unmolested. The Confederates, with the exception of Ashby, who halted at Bartonsville, a farm upon the pike, a mile and a half from the field of battle, fell back to Newtown, three miles further south, where the trains had been parked. The men were utterly worn out. Three hours of fierce fighting against far superior numbers had brought them to the limit of their endurance. In the fence corners, under the trees, and around the wagons they threw themselves down, many too weary to eat, and forgot, in profound slumber, the trials, the dangers, and the disappointments of the day. Jackson, when the last sounds of battle had died away, followed his troops. Halting by a campfire, he stood and warmed himself for a time, and then, remounting, rode back to Bartonsville. Only one staff officer, his chief commissary, Major Hawks, accompanied him. The rest had dropped away, overcome by exhaustion. Turning from the road into an orchard, he fastened up his horse and asked his companion if he could make a fire, adding, We shall have to burn fence rails tonight. The Major soon had a roaring fire and was making a bed of rails when the General wished to know what he was doing. Finding a place to sleep, was the reply. You seem determined to make yourself and those around you comfortable, said Jackson, and knowing the General had fasted all day, he soon obtained some bread and meat from the nearest squad of soldiers, and after they had satisfied their hunger, they slept soundly on the rail bed in a fence corner. Such was the Battle of Kernstown, in which over 1,200 men were killed and wounded, the half of them Confederates. Two or three hundred prisoners fell into the hands of the Federals. Nearly one-fourth of Jackson's infantry was hors de combat, and he had lost two guns. His troops were undoubtedly depressed. They had anticipated an easy victory. The overwhelming strength of the Federals had surprised them, and their losses had been severe. But no regret disturbed the slumbers of their leader. He had been defeated, it was true. But he looked further than the immediate result of the engagement. I feel justified in saying, he wrote in his short report, that though the battlefield is in the possession of the enemy, yet the most essential fruits of the victory are ours. As he stood before the campfire near Newtown, wrapped in his long cloak, his hands behind his back, and stirring the embers with his foot, one of Ashby's youngest troopers ventured to interrupt his reverie. The Yankees don't seem willing to quit Winchester, General. Winchester is a very pleasant place to stay in, sir, was the quick reply. Nothing daunted, the boy went on. It was reported that they were retreating, but I guess they're retreating after us. With his eyes still fixed on the blazing logs. I think I may say I am satisfied, sir, was Jackson's answer. And with no further notice of the silent circle round the fire, he stood gazing absently into the glowing flames. After a few minutes, the tall figure turned away, and without another word, strode off into the darkness. That Jackson divined the full effect of his attack would be to assert too much. That he realised that the battle, though a tactical defeat, was strategically a victory is very evident. He knew something of Banks, he knew more of McClellan, and the bearing of the valley on the defence of Washington had long been uppermost in his thoughts. He had learned from Napoleon to throw himself into the spirit of his enemy, and it is not improbable that when he stood before the fire near Newtown, he had already foreseen, in some degree at least, the events that would follow the news of his attack at Kernstown. The outcome of the battle was indeed far-reaching. Though the battle had been won, 
wrote Shields. Still, I could not have believed that Jackson would have hazarded a decisive engagement, so far from the main body, without expecting reinforcements. So, to be prepared for such a contingency, I set to work during the night to bring together all the troops within my reach. I sent an express after Williams' division, requesting the rear brigade, about twenty miles distant, to march all night and join me in the morning. I swept the posts in rear of almost all their guards, hurrying them forward by forced marches to be with me at daylight. General Banks, hearing of the engagement on his way to Washington, halted at Harper's Ferry, and he also ordered William's division to return at once to Winchester. One brigade only, which the order did not reach, continued the march to Manassas. This counter-movement met with McClellan's approval. He now recognised that Jackson's force, commanded as it was, was something more than a mere cause of observation, and that it was essential that it should be crushed. Your course was right, he telegraphed on receiving Banks's report. As soon as you are strong enough, push Jackson hard and drive him well beyond Strasbourg. The very moment the thorough defeat of Jackson will permit it, resume the movement on Manassas, always leaving the whole of Shields' command at or near Strasbourg and Winchester until the Manassas Gap Railway is fully repaired. Communicate fully and act vigorously. 8,000 men, William's division, were thus temporarily withdrawn from the force that was to cover Washington from the south. But this was only the first step. Jackson's action had forcibly attracted the attention of the federal government to the Upper Potomac. The president was already contemplating the transfer of Blenker's division from McClellan to Fremont. The news of Kernstown decided the question, and at the end of March these 9,000 men were ordered to West Virginia, halting at Strasbourg, in case Banks should then need them on their way. But even this measure did not altogether allay Mr Lincoln's apprehensions. McClellan had assured him, on April 1st, that 73,000 men would be left for the defence of the capital and its approaches. But in the original arrangement, with which the President had been satisfied, Williams was to have been brought to Manassas, and Shields alone left in the Shenandoah Valley. Under the new distribution, the President found that the force at Manassas would be decreased by two brigades, and at the same time, that while part of the troops McClellan had promised were not forthcoming, a large portion of those actually available were good for nothing. The officer left in command at Washington reported that nearly all his force was imperfectly disciplined, that several of the regiments were in a very disorganised condition, that efficient artillery regiments had been removed from the forts and that he had to relieve them with very new infantry regiments, entirely unacquainted with the duties of that arm. Lincoln submitted the question to six generals of the regular army, then present in Washington, and these officers replied that, in their opinion, the requirement of the President that this city shall be left entirely secure has not been fully complied with. On receiving this report, Lincoln ordered the 1st Army Corps, 37,000 strong under General McDowell, to remain at Manassas in place of embarking for the peninsula, and thus McClellan, on the eve of his advance on Richmond, found his original force of 150,000 reduced by 46,000 officers and men. Moreover, not content with detaching McDowell for a time, Lincoln, the next day, assigned that general to an independent command, covering the approaches to Washington. Banks also was withdrawn from McClellan's control and directed to defend the valley. The original dissemination of the Federal forces was thus gravely accentuated, and the Confederates had now to deal with four distinct armies, McClellan's, McDowell's, Banks and Fremont's, dependent for cooperation on the orders of two civilians, President Lincoln and his Secretary of War. And this was not all. McDowell had been assigned a most important part in McClellan's plan of invasion. The road from Fortress Monroe was barred by the fortifications of Yorktown. These works could be turned, however, by sending a force up the York River. But the passage of the stream was debarred to the Federal transports by a strong fort at Gloucester Point on the left bank, and the capture of this work was to be the task of the First Army Corps. No wonder that McClellan, believing that Johnston commanded 100,000 men, 
declared that in his deliberate judgment the success of the federal cause was imperiled by the order which detached MacDowell from his command. However inadequately the capital might be defended, it was worse than folly to interfere with the general's plans when he was on the eve of executing them. The best way of defending Washington was for McClellan to march rapidly on Richmond and seize his adversary by the throat. By depriving him of McDowell, Lincoln and his advisers made such a movement difficult, and the Grand Army of Invasion found itself in a most embarrassing situation. Such was the effect of a blow struck at the right place and the right time, though struck by no more than 3,000 bayonets. The Battle of Kernstown was undoubtedly well fought. It is true that Jackson believed that he had no more than four regiments of infantry, a few batteries, and some cavalry before him. But it was a skilful manoeuvre, which threw three brigades and three batteries, more than two-thirds of his whole strength, on his opponent's flank. An ordinary general would probably have employed only a small portion of his force in the turning movement. Not so the student of Napoleon. In the general's haversack, says one of Jackson's staff, were always three books, the Bible, Napoleon's Maxims of War and Webster's Dictionary, for his spelling was uncertain, and these books he constantly consulted. Whether the chronicles of the Jewish kings threw any light on the tactical problem involved at Kernstown may be left to the commentators, but there can be no question as to the maxims. To hurl overwhelming numbers at the point where the enemy least expects attack is the whole burden of Napoleon's teaching, and there can be no doubt but that the wooded ridge, unoccupied save by a few scouts, was the weakest point of the defence. The manoeuvre certainly surprised the Federals, and it very nearly beat them. Tyler's brigade was unsupported for nearly an hour and a half. Had his battalions been less staunch, the tardy reinforcements would have been too late to save the day. Coming up as they did, not in a mass so strong as to bear all before it by its own inherent weight, but in successive battalions, at wide intervals of time, they would themselves have become involved in a desperate engagement under adverse circumstances. Nor is Kimball to be blamed that he did not throw greater weight on Jackson's turning column at an earlier hour. Like Shields and Banks, he was unable to believe that Jackson was unsupported. He expected that the flank attack would be followed up by one in superior numbers from the front. He could hardly credit that an inferior force would deliberately move off to a flank, leaving its line of retreat to be guarded by a few squadrons, weakly supported by infantry, and the audacity of the assailant had the usual effect of deceiving the defender. Kernstown, moreover, will rank as an example of what determined men can do against superior numbers. The Confederates on the ridge throughout the greater part of the fight hardly exceeded 2,000 muskets. They were assailed by 3,000 and proved a match for them. The 3,000 were then reinforced by at least 3,000 more, whilst Jackson could bring up only 600 muskets to support an already broken line. Nevertheless, these 6,000 northerners were so roughly handled that there was practically no pursuit. When the Confederates fell back, every one of the Federal regiments had been engaged, and there were no fresh troops wherewith to follow them. Jackson was perfectly justified in reporting that night and an indisposition of the enemy to press further terminated the battle. But the action was attended by features more remarkable than the stubborn resistance of the Virginia regiments. It is seldom that a battle so insignificant as Kernstown has been followed by such extraordinary results. Fortune indeed favoured the Confederates. At the time of the battle, a large portion of McClellan's army was at sea, and the attack was delivered at the very moment when it was most dreaded by the Northern government. Nor was it to the disadvantage of the Southerners that the real head of the Federal Army was the President, and that his strategical conceptions were necessarily subservient to the attitude of the Northern people. These were circumstances purely fortuitous and it might seem, therefore, that Jackson merely blundered into success. But he must be given full credit for recognising that a blow at Banks might be fraught with most important consequences. It was with other ideas than defeating a rearguard or detaining Banks that he seized the Kernstown Ridge. He was not yet aware of McClellan's plan of invasion by sea, 
but he knew well that any movement that would threaten Washington must prove embarrassing to the federal government, that they could not afford to leave the Upper Potomac ill-secured, and that the knowledge that an active and enterprising enemy, who had shown himself determined to take instant advantage of every opportunity, was within the valley, would probably cause them to withdraw troops from McClellan in order to guard the river. A fortnight after the battle, asking for reinforcements, he wrote, If Banks is defeated, it may greatly retard McClellan's movements. Stubborn as had been the fighting of his brigades, Jackson himself was not entirely satisfied with his officers. When Sullivan and Kimball came to Tyler's aid, and a new line of battle threatened to overwhelm the Stonewall regiments, Garnett, on his own responsibility, had given the order to retire. Many of the men, their ammunition exhausted, had fallen to the rear. The exertions of the march had begun to tell. The enemy's attacks had been fiercely pressed, and before the pressure of his fresh brigades, the Confederate power of resistance was strained to breaking point. Garnett had behaved with conspicuous gallantry. The officers of his brigade declared that he was perfectly justified in ordering a retreat. Jackson thought otherwise, and almost immediately after the battle, he relieved him of his command, placed him under arrest, and framed charges for his trial by court-martial. He would not accept the excuse that ammunition had given out. At the time, the Stonewall Brigade gave back the 5th and 42nd Virginia were at hand. The men had still their bayonets, and he did not consider the means of victory exhausted until the cold steel had been employed. He insisted, says Dabney, that a more resolute struggle might have won the field. Now, in the first place, it must be conceded that Garnett had not the slightest right to abandon his position without a direct order. In the second, if we turn to the table of losses furnished by the brigade commander, we find that in Garnett's four regiments, numbering one to one hundred officers and men, there fell a hundred and fifty-three. In addition, 148 were reported missing, but, according to the official reports, the majority of these were captured by the Federal cavalry and were unwounded. At most, then, when he gave the order to retreat, Garnett had lost 200, or rather less than 20%. Such loss was heavy, but by no means excessive. A few months later, hardly a brigade in either army would have given way because every fifth man had fallen. A year later, and the Stonewall regiments would have considered an action in which they lost 200 men as nothing more than a skirmish. The truth would seem to be that the Valley soldiers were not yet blooded. In peace, the individual is everything. Material prosperity, self-indulgence, and the preservation of existence are the general aim. In war, the individual is nothing, and men learn the lesson of self-sacrifice. But it is only gradually however high the enthusiasm which inspires the troops, that the ideas of peace become effaced, and they must be seasoned soldiers who will endure, without flinching, the losses of Waterloo or Gettysburg. Discipline, which means the effacement of the individual, does more than break the soldier to unhesitating obedience. It trains him to die for duty's sake, and even the Stonewall Brigade in the spring of 1862 was not yet thoroughly disciplined. The lack of competent and energetic officers, writes Jackson's chief of staff, was at this time the bane of the service. In many there was neither an intelligent comprehension of their duties nor zeal in their performance. Appointed by the votes of their neighbours and friends, they would neither exercise that rigidity in governing, nor that detailed care in providing for the wants of their men, which are necessary to keep soldiers efficient. The duties of the drill and the sentry post were often negligently performed, and the most profuse waste of ammunition and other military stores was permitted. It was seldom that these officers were guilty of cowardice upon the field of battle, but they were often in the wrong place, fighting as common soldiers when they should have been directing others. Above all was their inefficiency marked in their inability to keep their men in the ranks. Absenteeism grew under them to a monstrous evil, and every poltroon and laggard found a way of escape. Hence the frequent phenomenon that regiments, which on the books of the commissary appeared as consumers of 500 or 1,000 rations, were reported as carrying into action 250 or 300 bayonets, 
It is unlikely that this picture is overcoloured, and it is certainly no reproach to the Virginia soldiers that their discipline was indifferent. There had not yet been time to transform a multitude of raw recruits into the semblance of a regular army. Competent instructors and trained leaders were few in the extreme, and the work had to be left in inexperienced hands. One Stonewall Jackson was insufficient to leaven a division of 5,000 men. In the second place, Jackson probably remembered that the Stonewall Brigade at Bull Run, dashing out with the bayonet on the advancing Federals, had driven them back on their reserves. It seems hardly probable, had Garnett at Kernstown held his ground a little longer, that the three regiments still intact could have turned the tide of battle. But it is not impossible. The Federals had been roughly handled. Their losses had been heavier than those of the Confederates. A resolute counterstroke has before now changed the face of battle, and among unseasoned soldiers panic spreads with extraordinary effect. So far as can be gathered from the reports, there is no reason to suspect that the vigour of the Federal battalions was as yet relaxed, but no one who was not actually present can presume to judge of the temper of the troops. In every well-contested battle there comes a moment when the combatants on both sides become exhausted, and the general who at that moment finds it in his heart to make one more effort will generally succeed. Such was the experience of Grant, Virginia's stoutest enemy. That moment, perhaps, had come at Kernstown, and Jackson, than whom not Skobolev himself had clearer vision or cooler brain in the tumult of battle, may have observed it. It cannot be too often repeated that numbers go for little on the battlefield. It is possible that Jackson had in his mind, when he declared that the victory might yet have been won, the decisive counterstroke at Marengo, where 20,000 Austrians, pressing forward in pursuit of a defeated enemy, were utterly overthrown by a fresh division of 6,000 men, supported by four squadrons. Tactical unity and moral are factors of far more importance in battle than mere numerical strength. Troops that have been hotly engaged, even with success, and whose nerves are wrought up to a high state of tension, are peculiarly susceptible to surprise. If they have lost their order, and the men find themselves under strange officers, with unfamiliar faces beside them, the counterstroke falls with even greater force. It is at such moments that cavalry still finds its opportunity. It is at such moments that a resolute charge, pushed home with drums beating and a loud cheer, may have extraordinary results. On August 6th, 1870, on the heights of Worth, a German corps d'armée, emerging after three hours' fierce fighting from the Great Wood on McMahon's flank, bore down upon the last stronghold of the French. The troops were in the utmost confusion. Divisions, brigades, regiments and companies were mingled in one motley mass. But the enemy was retreating. A heavy force of artillery was close at hand, and the infantry must have numbered at least 10,000 rifles. Suddenly three battalions of Turcos, numbering no more than 1,500 bayonets, charged with wild cries and without firing down the grassy slope. The Germans halted, fired a few harmless volleys, and then, turning as one man, bolted to the shelter of the wood, 1,200 yards in rear. According to an officer of the 14th Indiana, the Federals at Kernstown were in much the same condition as the Germans at Worth. The Confederates fell back in great disorder, and we advanced in disorder just as great. Over logs, through woods, over hills and fields, the brigades, regiments and companies advanced in one promiscuous, mixed and uncontrollable mass. Officers shouted themselves hoarse in trying to bring order out of confusion, but all their efforts were unavailing along the front line, or rather what ought to have been the front line. Garnett's conduct was not the only incident connected with Kernstown that troubled Jackson. March 23rd was a Sunday. You appear much concerned, he writes to his wife, at my attacking on Sunday. I am greatly concerned too, but I felt it my duty to do it in consideration of the ruinous effects that might result from postponing the battle until the morning. So far as I can see, my course was a wise one. The best that I could do under the circumstances, though very distasteful to my feelings, and I hope and pray to our Heavenly Father that I may never again be circumstanced as on that day. 
I believed that, so far as our troops were concerned, necessity and mercy both called for the battle. I do hope that the war will soon be over, and that I shall never again be called upon to take the field. Arms is a profession that, if its principles are adhered to, requires an officer to do what he fears may be wrong, and yet, according to military experience, must be done if success is to be attained. And the fact of its being necessary to success, and being accompanied with success, and that a departure from it is accompanied with disaster, suggests that it must be right. Had I fought the battle on Monday instead of Sunday, I fear our cause would have suffered, whereas, as things turned out, I consider our cause gained much from the engagement. We may wonder if his wife detected the unsoundness of the argument. To do wrong, for wrong it was, according to her creed, in order that good may ensue is what it comes to. The literal interpretation of the scriptural rule seems to have led her husband into difficulties, but the incident may serve to show with what earnestness in every action of his life he strove to shape his conduct with what he believed to be his duty. It has already been observed that Jackson's reticence was remarkable. No general could have been more careful that no inkling of his design should reach the enemy. He had not the slightest hesitation in withholding his plans from even his second in command. Special correspondents were rigorously excluded from his camps, and even with his most confidential friends, his reserve was absolutely impenetrable. During his stay at Winchester, it was his custom directly he rose to repair to headquarters and open his correspondence. When he returned to breakfast at Dr. Graham's, there was much anxiety evinced to hear the news from the front. What the enemy was doing across the Potomac, scarce thirty miles away, was naturally of intense interest to the people of the border town. But not the smallest detail of intelligence, however unimportant, escaped his lips. To his wife he was as uncommunicative as to the rest. Neither hint nor suggestion made the least impression, and direct interrogations were put by with a quiet smile. Nor was he too shy to suggest to his superiors that silence was golden. In a report to Johnston, written four days after Kernstown, he administered what can scarcely be considered other than a snub, delicately expressed but unmistakable. It is understood in the Federal Army that you have instructed me to keep the forces now in this district and not permit them to cross the Blue Ridge, and that this must be done at every hazard, and that for the purpose of effecting this, I made my attack. I have never so much as intimated such a thing to anyone. It cannot be said that Jackson's judgment in attacking Shields was at once appreciated in the South. The defeat at first was ranked with the disasters in the West, but as soon as the effects upon the enemy were appreciated, the tide of popular feeling turned. The gallantry of the Valley regiments was fully recognised, and the thanks of Congress were tendered to Jackson and his troops. No battle was ever yet fought in exact accordance with the demands of theory, and Kernstown, great in its results, gives openings to the critics. Jackson, it is said, attacked with tired troops on insufficient information and contrary to orders. As to the first, it may be said that his decision to give the enemy no time to bring up fresh troops was absolutely justified by events. On hearing of his approach to Kernstown, Banks immediately countermarched a brigade of William's division from Castleman's Ferry. A second brigade was recalled from Snicker's Gap on the morning of the 24th and reached Winchester the same evening, after a march of six and twenty miles. Had attack been deferred, Shields would have been strongly reinforced. As to the second, Jackson had used every means in his power to get a curate intelligence Ashby had done his best. All through the Federals had 780 cavalry present, and every approach to Winchester was strongly picketed. His scouts had pushed within the Federal lines and had communicated with the citizens of Winchester. Their reports were confirmed, according to Jackson's dispatch, from a source which had been remarkable for its reliability, and for the last two days a retrograde movement towards Snicker's Gap had been reported. The ground, it is true, favoured an ambush, but the strategic situation demanded instant action. McClellan's advanced guard was within 50 miles of Johnston's position on the Rapidan, 
and a few days' march might bring the main armies into collision. If Jackson was to bring Banks back to the valley and himself join Johnston before the expected battle, he had no time to spare. Moreover, the information to hand was quite sufficient to justify him in trusting something to fortune. Even a defeat, if the attack were resolutely pushed, might have the best effect. The third reproach, that Jackson disobeyed orders, can hardly be sustained. He was in command of a detached force operating at a distance from the main army, and Johnston, with a wise discretion, had given him not orders, but instructions. That is, the general-in-chief had merely indicated the purpose for which Jackson's force had been detached, and left to his judgment the manner in which that purpose was to be achieved. Johnston had certainly suggested that he should not expose himself to the danger of defeat, but when it became clear that he could not retain the enemy in the valley unless he closed with him, to have refrained from attack would have been to disobey the spirit of his instructions. Again, when Jackson attacked, he had good reason to believe that he ran no risk of defeat whatever. The force before him was reported as inferior to his own, and he might well have argued, To confine myself to observation will be to confess my weakness, and Banks is not likely to arrest his march to Manassas because of the presence of an enemy who dare not attack an insignificant rearguard. Demonstrations, such as Johnston had advised, may undoubtedly serve a temporary purpose, but if protracted, the enemy sees through them. On the 22nd, for instance, it was reported to Banks that the Confederates were advancing. The rear brigade of William's division was therefore countermarched from Snicker's Gap to Berryville, but the other two were suffered to proceed. Had Jackson remained quiescent in front of Shields, tacitly admitting his inferiority, the rear brigade would in all probability have soon been ordered to resume its march, and Lincoln, with no fear for Washington, would have allowed Blenker and McDowell to join McClellan. Johnston, at least, held that his subordinate was justified. In publishing the thanks of the Confederate Congress tendered to Jackson and his division, he expressed, at the same time, his own sense of their admirable conduct by which they fully earned the high reward bestowed. During the evening of the 23rd, the medical director of the Valley Army was ordered to collect vehicles and send the wounded to the rear before the troops continued their retreat. Sometime after midnight, Dr. Maguire, finding that there were still a large number awaiting removal, reported the circumstances to the general, adding that he did not know where to get the means of transport and that unless some expedient were discovered, the men must be abandoned. Jackson ordered him to impress carriages in the neighbourhood. But, said the surgeon, that requires time. Can you stay till it has been done? Make yourself easy, sir, was the reply. This army stays here until the last man is removed. Before I leave them to the enemy, I will lose many men more. Fortunately, before daylight, the work was finished. Chapter 9 Medowell. The stars were still shining when the Confederates began their retreat from Kernstown. With the exception of seventy, all the wounded had been brought in, and the army followed the ambulances as far as Woodstock. March 25th. There was little attempt on the part of the Federals to improve their victory. The hard fighting of the Virginians had left its impress on the generals. Jackson's numbers were estimated at 15,000, and Banks, who arrived in time to take direction of the pursuit, preferred to wait till William's two brigades came up before he moved. He encamped that night at Cedar Creek, eight miles from Kernstown. The next day he reached Strasbourg. The cavalry pushed on to near Woodstock, and there, for the time being, the pursuit terminated. Shields, who remained at Winchester to nurse his wound, sent enthusiastic telegrams announcing that the retreat was a flight and that the houses along the road were filled with Jackson's dead and dying. Yet the truth was that the Confederates were in no wise pressed and only the hopeless cases had been left behind. Had the 2,000 troopers at Banks's disposal been sent forward at daybreak on the 24th, something might have been done. The squadrons, however, incapable of moving across country, were practically useless in pursuit and to start even at daybreak was to start too late. If the fruits of victory are to be secured, 
the work must be put in hand whilst the enemy is still reeling under the shock. A few hours' delay gives him time to recover his equilibrium, to organise a rear guard, and to gain many miles on his rearward march. March 26th. On the night of the 26th, 60 hours after the battle ceased, the Federal outposts were established along Tom's Brook, 17 miles from Kernstown. On the opposite bank were Ashby's cavalry, while Burks's brigade lay at Woodstock, six miles further south. The remainder of the Valley Army had reached Mount Jackson. These positions were occupied until April 1st, and for six whole days Banks, with 19,000 men, was content to observe a force one-sixth his strength, which had been defeated by just half the numbers he had now at his disposal. This was hardly the vigorous action which McClellan had demanded. As soon as you are strong enough, he had telegraphed, push Jackson hard, drive him well beyond Strasbourg, pursuing at least as far as Woodstock if possible, with cavalry to Mount Jackson. In vain he reiterated the message on the 27th, feel Jackson's rear guard smartly and push him well. Not a single Federal crossed Tom's Brook. The superb scenery of the valley, writes General G. H. Gordon, a comrade of Jackson's at West Point, and now commanding the 2nd Massachusetts, one of Banks' best regiments, opened before us. The sparkling waters of the Shenandoah, winding between the parallel ranges, the groves of cedar and pine that lined its banks, the rolling surfaces of the valley, peacefully resting by the mountainside and occupied by rich fields and quiet farms. A mile beyond I could see the rebel cavalry. Sometimes the enemy amused himself by throwing shells at our pickets when they were a little too venturesome, but beyond a feeble show of strength and ugliness, nothing transpired to disturb the dullness of the camp. Banks, far from all support, and with a cavalry unable to procure information, was by no means free from apprehension. Johnston had already fallen back into the interior of Virginia, and the Army of the Potomac, instead of following him, was taking ship at Alexandria. Information had reached Strasbourg that the Confederates were behind the Rapidan, with their left at Gordonsville. Now Gordonsville is 65 miles, or four marches, from Mount Jackson, and there was reason to believe that reinforcements had already been sent to Jackson from that locality. On March 25th, Banks telegraphed to Mr Stanton, reported by Rebel Jackson's aide, a prisoner, that they were assured of reinforcements to 30,000, but don't credit it. On March 26th, the enemy is broken but will rally. Their purpose is to unite Jackson's and Longstreet's forces, some 20,000, at New Market, seven miles south of Mount Jackson, or Washington, east of Blue Ridge, in order to operate on either side of the mountains and will desire to prevent our junction with the force at Manassas. At present, they will not attack here. It will relieve me greatly to know how far the enemy, i.e. Johnston, will be pressed in front of Manassas. On the 27th, his news was less alarming. Enemy is about four miles below Woodstock. No reinforcement received yet. Jackson has constant communication with Johnston, who is east of the mountains, probably at Gordonsville. His pickets are very strong and vigilant, none of the country people being allowed to pass the lines under any circumstances. The same rule is applied to troops, stragglers from Winchester not being permitted to enter their lines, we shall press them further and quickly. The pressure, however, was postponed, and on the 29th, McClellan desired Banks to ascertain the intentions of the enemy as soon as possible, and if he were in force to drive him from the valley of the Shenandoah. Thus spurred, Banks at last resolved to cross the Rubicon. Deficiency, he replied, in ammunition for Shields' artillery detains us here, Expect it hourly, when we shall push Jackson sharply. It was not, however, till April 2nd, four days later, that Mr Lincoln's protégé crossed Tom's Brook. His advanced guard, after a brisk skirmish with Ashby, reached the village of Edinburgh, ten miles south, the same evening. The main body occupied Woodstock, and McClellan telegraphed that he was much pleased with the vigorous pursuit 
It is not impossible that Banks suspected that McClellan's commendations were ironical. In any case, praise had no more effect upon him than a peremptory order or the promise of reinforcements. He was instructed to push forward as far as New Market. He was told that he would be joined by two regiments of cavalry, and that two brigades of Blenker's division were marching to Strasbourg. But Jackson, although Ashby had been driven in, still held obstinately to his position, and from Woodstock and Edinburgh banks refused to move. On April 4th, becoming independent of McClellan, he at once reported to the Secretary of War that he hoped immediately to strike Jackson an effective blow. Immediately, however, in Banks' opinion, was capable of a very liberal interpretation, for it was not till April 17th that he once more broke up his camps. Well might Gordon write that life at Edinburgh became monotonous. It is but fair to mention that during the whole of this time, Banks was much troubled about supply and transport. His magazines were at Winchester, connected with Harper's Ferry and Washington by a line of railway which had been rapidly repaired, and on April 12th, this line had become unserviceable through the spreading of the roadbed. His wagon train, moreover, had been diverted to Manassas before the fight at Kernstown, and was several days late in reaching Strasbourg. The country in which he was operating was rich, and requisitions were made upon the farmers. But in the absence of the wagons, according to his own report, it was impossible to collect sufficient supplies for a further advance. The weather, too, had been unfavourable. The first days of April were like summer. But hardly, says Gordon, had we begun to feel in harmony with sunny days and blooming peach trees and warm showers before a chill came over us, bitter as the hatred of the women of Virginia, the ground covered with snow, the air thick with hail, and the mountains hidden in the chilly atmosphere. Our shivering sentinels on the outer lines met at times the gaze of half-frozen horsemen of the enemy, peering through the mist to see what the Yankees had been doing within the last twenty-four hours. It was hard to believe that we were in the sunny south. All this, however, was hardly an excuse for absolute inaction. The Confederate position on the open ridge called Rude's Hill, two and a half miles south of Mount Jackson, was certainly strong. It was defended in front by Mill Creek, swollen by the snows to a turbulent and unfordable river, and by the north fork of the Shenandoah. But with all its natural strength, Rude's Hill was but weakly held, and Banks knew it. Moreover, it was most unlikely that Jackson would be reinforced, for Johnston's army, with the exception of a detachment under General Ewell, had left Orange Courthouse for Richmond on April 5th. The enemy, Banks wrote to McClellan on April 6th, is reduced to about 6,000 men, SIC, much demoralised by defeat, desertion and the general depression of spirits resting on the Southern Army. He is not in a condition to attack, neither to make a strong resistance, and I do not believe he will make a determined stand there. I do not believe Johnston will reinforce him. If Banks had supplies enough to enable him to remain at Woodstock, there seems to have been no valid reason why he should not have been able to drive away a demoralised enemy and to hold a position twelve miles further south. But the Federal commander, despite his brave words, had not yet got rid of his misgivings. Jackson had lured him into a most uncomfortable situation. Between the two branches of the Shenandoah, in the very centre of the valley, rises a gigantic mass of mountain ridges, parallel throughout their length of fifty miles to the Blue Ridge and the Alleghanies. These are the famous Massanuttons, the glory of the valley. The peaks which form their northern faces sink as abruptly to the level near Strasbourg as does the single hill which looks down on Harrisonburg. Dense forests of oak and pine cover ridge and ravine, and 2,500 feet below, on either hand parted by the mighty barrier, are the dales watered by the forks of the Shenandoah. That to the east is the narrower and less open. The Blue Ridge is nowhere more than ten miles distant from the Massanuttons, and the space between them, the Luray or the South Fork Valley, through which a single road leads northward, is clothed by continuous forest. West of the Great Mountain, a broad expanse of green pasture and rich arable extends to the foothills of the Alleghenies, dotted with woods and homesteads, 
and here, in the valley of the North Fork, is freer air and more space for movement. The separation of the two valleys is accentuated by the fact that save at one point only the Massanuttons are practically impassable. From Newmarket, in the Western Valley, a good road climbs the heights, and crossing the lofty plateau sinks sharply down to Luray, the principal village on the South Fork. Elsewhere, precipitous gullies and sheer rock faces forbid all access to the mountain, and a few hunters' paths alone wind tediously through the woods up the steep hillside. Nor are signal stations to be found on the wide area of unbroken forest which clothes the summit. Except from the peaks at either end, or from one or two points on the new Market Luray Road, the view is intercepted by the sea of foliage and the rolling spurs. Striking eastward from Luray, two good roads cross the Blue Ridge, one running to Culpeper Courthouse through Thornton's Gap, the other through Fisher's Gap to Gordonsville. It was the Massanuttons that weighed on the mind of Banks. The Valley of the South Fork gave the Confederates a covered approach against his line of communications. Issuing from that straight cleft between the mountains, Ashby's squadrons might at any time sweep down upon his trains of wagons, his hospitals and his magazines, and should Jackson be reinforced, Ashby might be supported by infantry and guns, and both Strasbourg and Winchester be endangered. It was not within Banks' power to watch the defile. His cavalry, he reported, was weak in numbers and spirit, much exhausted with night and day work. Good cavalry, he declared, would help incalculably, and he admitted that in this arm he was greatly inferior to the enemy. Nor was he more happy as to the Alleghenies on his right. Fremont was meditating an advance on Lewisburg, Staunton, and the Virginia and Tennessee Railway with 25,000 men. One column was to start from Gawley Bridge in the Kanawha Valley, the other from the south branch of the Potomac. Milroy's brigade from Cheat Mountain had therefore occupied Monterey, and Schenck's brigade had marched from Romney to Moorfield. But Moorfield was 30 miles west of Woodstock, and between them rose a succession of rugged ridges, within whose deep valleys the Confederate horsemen might find paths by which to reach to Banks' rear. It was essential, then, that his communications should be strongly guarded, and as he advanced up the valley, his force had diminished at every march. According to his own report, he had, on April 6th, 16,700 men fit for duty. Of these, 4,100 were detached along the road from Woodstock to Harper's Ferry. His effective strength for battle was thus reduced to 12,600, or including the troops escorting convoys and the garrison of Strasbourg, to 14,500 men with 40 pieces of artillery. Such were the considerations that influenced the Federal commander. Had he occupied New Market, as McClellan had desired, he would have secured the Luray Road, have opened the South Fork Valley to his scouts, and have overcome half the difficulties presented by the Massanuttons. A vigorous advance would have turned the attention of the Confederates from his communications to their own, and to drive Jackson from the valley was the best method of protecting the trains and the magazines. But Banks was not inclined to beard the lion in his den, and on April 16th Jackson had been unmolested for more than three weeks. Ashby's troopers were the only men who had even seen the enemy. Daily that indefatigable soldier had called to arms the Federal outposts. Our stay at Edinburgh, says Gordon, was a continuous season of artillery brawling and picket-stalking. The creek that separated the outposts was not more than ten yards wide. About one-fourth of a mile away there was a thick wood in which the enemy concealed his batteries until he chose to stir us up, when he would sneak up behind the cover, open upon us at an unexpected moment, and retreat rapidly when we replied. It was doubtless by such constant evidence of his vigilance that Ashby imposed caution on the enemy's reconnoitering parties. The fact remains that Jackson's camps, six miles to the rear, were never once alarmed, nor could Banks obtain any reliable information. This period of repose was spent by Jackson in reorganising his regiments, in writing letters to his wife, and, like his old classmate, Gordon, in admiring the scenery. It is not to be supposed that his enforced inaction was altogether to his taste. 
With an enemy within sight of his outposts, his bold and aggressive spirit must have been sorely tried. But with his inferior numbers, prudence cried patience, and he had reason to be well content with the situation. He had been instructed to prevent Banks from detaching troops to reinforce McClellan. To attain an object in war, the first consideration is to make no mistakes yourself. The next, to take instant advantage of those made by your opponent. But compliance with this rule does not embrace the whole art of generalship. The enemy may be too discreet to commit himself to risky manoeuvres. If the campaigns of the great masters of war are examined, it will be found that they but seldom adopted a quiescent attitude, but by one means or another, by acting on their adversary's moral, or by creating false impressions, they induced him to make a false step and to place himself in a position which made it easy for them to attain their object. The greatest general has been defined as he who makes the fewest mistakes, but he who compels his adversary to make the most mistakes is a definition of equal force and it may even be questioned whether the general whose imagination is unequal to the stratagems which bring mistakes about is worthy of the name. He may be a trustworthy subordinate, but he can scarcely become a great leader. Johnston had advised when, at the beginning of March, the retreat of the Confederates from Winchester was determined on, that Jackson should fall back on Front Royal and thence, if necessary, up the south fork of the Shenandoah. His force would thus be in close communication with the main army behind the Rapidan, and it was contrary, in the General-in-Chief's opinion, to all sound discretion to permit the enemy to attain a point, such as Front Royal, which would render it possible for him to place himself between them. Jackson, however, declared his preference for a retreat up the North Fork in the direction of Staunton. Why should Banks join McClellan at all? McClellan, so Jackson calculated, had already more men with him than he could feed, and he believed, therefore, that Staunton would be Banks' objective, because by seizing that town he would threaten Edward Johnson's rear, open the way for Fremont, and then, crossing the Blue Ridge, place himself so near the communications of the main army with Richmond that it would be compelled to fall back to defend them. Nor, in any case, did he agree with Johnston that the occupation of Front Royal would prevent Banks leaving the valley and marching to Manassas. Twenty miles due east of Winchester is Snickers Gap, where a good road crosses the Blue Ridge, and eight miles south another turnpike leads over Ashby's Gap. By either of these, Banks could reach Manassas just as rapidly as Jackson could join Johnston, and while 4,500 men could scarcely be expected to detain 20,000, they might very easily be cut off by a portion of the superior force. If a junction with the main army were absolutely necessary, Jackson was of opinion that the move ought to be made at once and the valley abandoned. If, on the other hand, it was desirable to keep Banks and McClellan separated, the best means of doing so was to draw the former up the North Fork. And at Mount Jackson, covering the new market to Luray Road, the valley troops would be as near the Rapidan as if they were at Front Royal. The strategical advantages which such a position would offer, the isolation of the troops pursuing him, the chance of striking their communications from the South Fork Valley, and, if reinforcements were granted, of cutting off their retreat by a rapid movement from Luray to Winchester, were always present to Jackson's mind. An additional argument was that at the time when these alternatives were discussed, the road along South Fork was so bad as to make marching difficult, and it was to this, rather than to Jackson's strategical conceptions, that Johnston appears to have ultimately yielded. Be this as it may, the sum of Jackson's operations was satisfactory in the extreme. On March 27th he had written to Johnston, I will try and draw the enemy on. On April 16th, Banks was exactly where he wished him, well up the north fork of the Shenandoah, cut off by the Massanuttons from Manassas and by the Alleghanies from Fremont. The two detachments which held the valley, his own force at Mount Jackson, and Edward Johnson's 2,800 on the Shenandoah mountain, were in close communication, and could at any time, if permitted by the higher authorities, combine against either of the columns which threatened Staunton. What I desire, he said to Mr. Boatler, a friend in the Confederate Congress, 
is to hold the country as far as practicable until we are in a condition to advance, and then, with God's blessing, let us make thorough work of it, but let us start right. On April 7th, he wrote to his wife as follows. Your sickness gives me great concern, but so live that it and all your tribulations may be sanctified to you, remembering that our light afflictions, which are but for a moment, work out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I trust you and all I have in the hands of a kind providence, knowing that all things work together for the good of his people. Yesterday was a lovely Sabbath day. Although I had not the privilege of hearing the word of life, yet it felt like a holy Sabbath day, beautiful, serene and lovely. All it wanted was the church bell and God's services in the sanctuary to make it complete. Our gallant little army is increasing in numbers, and my prayer is that it may be an army of the living God as well as of its country. The troops, notwithstanding their defeat at Kernstown, were in high spirits, the very slackness of the federal pursuit had made them aware that they had inflicted a heavy blow. They had been thanked by Congress for their valour. The newspapers were full of their praises. Their comrades were returning from hospital and furlough, and recruits were rapidly coming in. The mounted branch attracted the majority, and Ashby's regiment soon numbered more than 2,000 troopers. Their commander, however, knew little of discipline. Besides himself, there was but one field officer for one and twenty companies, nor had these companies any regimental organisation. When Jackson attempted to reduce this curiously constituted force to order, his path was once more crossed by the Secretary of War. Mr Benjamin, dazzled by Ashby's exploits, had given him authority to raise and command a force of independent cavalry. A reference to this authority and a threat of resignation was Ashby's reply to Jackson's orders. Knowing Ashby's ascendancy over his men, and finding himself thus deprived of legitimate power, the general was constrained to pause, and the cavalry was left unorganised and undisciplined. One half was rarely available for duty. The remainder were roaming over the country, imposing upon the generous hospitalities of the citizens, or lurking in their homes. The exploits of their famous leader were all performed with a few hundreds, or often scores, of men, who followed him from personal devotion rather than force of discipline. By April 15th, Jackson's force had increased to 6,000 men. McClellan had now landed an army of over 100,000 at Fortress Monroe, on the Yorktown Peninsula, and Johnston had marched thither to oppose him. The weather had at last cleared. Although the mountain pines stood deep in snow, the roads were in good order. The rivers were once more fordable. The Manassas Gap Railway had been restored as far as Strasbourg, and Banks took heart of grace. April 17th On the 17th, his forces were put in motion. One of Ashby's companies was surprised and captured. A brigade was sent to turn the Confederate left by a ford of the North Fork. And when the Virginians, burning the railway station at Mount Jackson, fell back southwards, the Federal cavalry seized New Market. For the moment, the situation of the Valley Army was somewhat critical. When Johnston marched to the peninsula, he had left a force of 8,000 men under General Ewell on the upper Rappahannock, and with this force, Jackson had been instructed to cooperate. But with the road across the Massanuttons in his possession, Banks could move into the Lure Valley, and occupying Swift Run Gap with a detachment, cut the communication between the two Confederate generals. It was essential, then, that this important pass should be secured, and Jackson's men were called on for a forced march. April 18th On the morning of the 18th they reached Harrisonburg, 25 miles from Mount Jackson, and halted the same evening at Peel's, about six miles east. April 19th. On the 19th, they crossed the Shenandoah at Conrad's store, and leaving a detachment to hold the bridge, moved to the foot of Swift Run Gap and went into camp in Elk Run Valley. In three days, they had marched over 50 miles. Banks followed with his customary caution, and when, on the 17th, his cavalry occupied New Market, he was congratulated by the Secretary of War on his brilliant and successful operations.
On the 19th, he led a detachment across the Massanuttons and seized the two bridges over the South Fork at Luray, driving back a squadron which Jackson had sent to burn them. April 22nd. On the night of the 22nd, his cavalry reached Harrisonburg, and he reported that want of supplies alone prevented him from bringing the Confederates to bay. April 26th. On the 26th, he sent two of his five brigades to Harrisonburg, the remainder halting at New Market, and for the last few days, according to his own dispatches, beef, flour and forage had been abundant, yet it had taken him ten days to march five and thirty miles. April 20th. On April 20th, General Edward Johnson, menaced in rear by Banks' advance, in flank by the brigade which Fremont had placed at Moorfield, and in front by Milroy's brigade, which had advanced from Monterey, had fallen back from the Shenandoah mountain to West View, seven miles west of Staunton, and to all appearance the Federal prospects were exceedingly favourable. Harrisonburg is five and twenty miles, or two short marches, north of Staunton. The hamlet of Medowell, now occupied by Milroy, is seven and twenty miles northwest. Proper concert between Banks and Fremont should therefore have ensured the destruction or retreat of Edward Johnson and have placed Staunton, as well as the Virginia Central Railroad, in their hands. But although not a single picket stood between his outposts and Staunton, Banks dared not move. By moving to Elk Run Valley, Jackson had barred the way of the Federals more effectively than if he had entrenched his troops across the Staunton Road. South of Harrisonburg, where the valley widens to five and twenty miles, there was no strong position, and even had such existed, six thousand men, of which a third were cavalry, could scarcely have hoped to hold it permanently against a far superior force. Moreover, cooped up inside entrenchments, the army of the valley would have lost all freedom of action, and Jackson would have been cut off both from Ewell and from Richmond. But, although direct intervention was impracticable, he was nonetheless resolved that Banks should never set foot in Staunton. The Elk Run Valley was well adapted for his purpose. Spurs of the Blue Ridge, steep, pathless and densely wooded, covered either flank. The front, protected by the Shenandoah, was very strong. Communication with both Ewell and Richmond was secure, and so long as he held the bridge at Conrad's store, he threatened the flank of the Federals should they advance on Staunton. Strategically, the position was by no means perfect. The Confederates, to use an expression of General Grant's, applied to a similar situation, were in a bottle. A bold enemy would have seized the bridge, corking up Jackson with a strong detachment, and have marched on Staunton with his main body. Had Banks been more enterprising, says Dabney, this objection would have been decisive. But he was not enterprising, and Jackson knew it. He had had opportunities in plenty of judging his opponent's character. The slow advance on Winchester, the long delay at Woodstock, the cautious approach to New Market, had revealed enough. It was a month since the Battle of Kernstown, and yet the Confederate infantry, although for the greater part of the time they had been encamped within a few miles of the enemy's outposts, had not fired a shot. The tardy progress of the Federals from Woodstock to Harrisonburg had been due rather to the perplexities of their commander than to the difficulties of supply, and Banks had got clear of the Massanuttons only to meet with fresh embarrassments. Jackson's move to Elk Run Valley was a complete checkmate, his opponent felt that he was dangerously exposed. McClellan had not yet begun his advance on Richmond, and so long as that city was secure from immediate attack, the Confederates could spare men to reinforce Jackson. The railway ran within easy reach of Swift Run Gap, and the troops need not be long absent from the capital. Ewell, too, with a force of unknown strength, was not far distant. Banks could expect no help from Fremont. Both generals were anxious to work together, and plans had been submitted to Washington which would probably have secured the capture of Staunton and the control of the railway. But the Secretary of War rejected all advice. Fremont was given to understand that under no circumstances was he to count on Banks, and the latter was told to halt at Harrisonburg. It is not the desire of the President, 
wrote Mr. Stanton on April 26, that you should prosecute a further advance towards the South. It is possible that events may make it necessary to transfer the command of General Shields to the Department of the Rappahannock, i.e. to the First Army Corps, and you are desired to act accordingly. To crown all, Blenker's division, which had reached Winchester, instead of being sent to support Banks, 45 miles distant by the Valley Turnpike, was ordered to join Fremont in the Alleghenies by way of Romney, involving a march of 120 miles over bad roads before it could reinforce his advanced brigade. Stanton, in writing to Banks, suggested that he should not let his advanced guard get too far ahead of the main body. But he does not appear to have seen that the separation of Banks, Fremont and Blenker, and the forward position of the two former, which he had determined to maintain, was even more dangerous. His lesson was to come, for Jackson, by no means content with arresting Banks's march, was already contemplating that general's destruction, 